like to bring you to uh, a ledge again. We talked last week um, about the story of Abraham and I'm sharing with you about uh, repelling off of the ledge and teaching students uh, how to repel. I'd like to bring you to a ledge uh, again, but it's different. Instead of going down, it goes up. Can you imagine that with me? Walking on a rocky level place and you come to like a cliff and it just goes straight up. Um, I have repelled and um, top rope climbed with students a lot, but I want to tell you about my first and only time to lead climb. Um, first and only. Um, lead climbing is a bit different. Um, top rope climbing, this is not repelling. Top rope climbing, um, you are on the ground and the rope has already gone up to where you're going. So you're just essentially following your rope. It's already attached to immovable objects up there. It goes up through and then down to a person who's belaying you, keeping you safe. Uh, lead climbing is different. There is no rope that goes up. You take the rope up with you. Um, and so your belayer is attached just from you um, to the, um, from the belayer rope to you, and that's it. And so you take up the rope and you're gonna attach it to either bolts that are already put into the rock wall, or you're going to add these things as you go with things called cams or nuts or different things. Um, the climb that I was doing for the first time, my brother, my only brother, was my belayer. And um, this was not a beginner or an intermediate kind of climb. And I'm not a great rock climber. My brother at the time was incredible. He was very much better than me. But he said, we can do this. We'll do it together. And he had done it a lot, so he was teaching me. So I get on, and we go through all the commands, on belay, belay is on, blah, 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 we got it, okay. And so uh, I, I don't have any, anything to take up. All I have is these bolts that are already in the wall, probably about 10 feet apart. So I jump from the boulder here across a little gap that's at the bottom of the climb to the wall, and I secure myself. This is pink granite, so there's sharp, big crystals um, that you're looking for to handhold. I got my chalk bag, I'm going up. I get up to the first one. I clip in and I'm like, well, at least I got that one. And then you start to get a little higher. Um, and the, the difficulty with lead climbing is the belayer is down there and it goes through a clip in the wall and then it comes up to you. And so as you go, when you get to the next hold, um, which is usually above you, you want to get it as quick as you can, you give your belayer a signal. He lets some slack into the rope and you grab the rope, you pull it up to your teeth, put it in your teeth, grab it again to get some slack, and then you pull it and clip it into the next one. And now you're safe, and then you keep going. Um, if any time you fall during this process, um, there's going to be much more give than a regular top rope climbing, because you're climbing up with the rope already up, the belayer's just taking out the slack when you fall, you fall about that much, it's all good. Um, lead climbing's a little different. This is why it was my first and only time to lead climb. I was probably three or four holds up, so 30 or 40 feet up. It was just about halfway. The climb was quite long. Um, and I was on a really precarious spot. Both of my feet in really nice climbing shoes were on crystals. I remember my left hand being on a pretty good hold. And uh, I said, okay, and the next clip was above. And so he let the belay off and I got the slack and I grabbed the rope and put it here, and then I went to grab it again, and something caught in his belay, so it just gave a little, just that. And so I had it in my mouth, and then just a little this, and my left foot slipped. And a nanosecond later, my left hand, and then my right hand, and the only problem is, is I've got six, eight, nine feet of slack in my hand. And the last hold is, a, you know, eight or nine feet below me. And so I, I'm going to fall a long way before the rope catches. Um, and uh, I'm not a lead climber, so I don't have good instincts. So when I slipped and started to go straight down the face of the rock, I pushed away. I just went like that and pushed away, which made me go away from the rock. And then the rope caught. And I experienced what is called a whipper. Because when all of your weight is going 9.8 meters per second squared downward in the force of gravity and the rope catches, you meet the rock again. 
And uh, I sort of had this whipper. Uh, fortunately, I was looking to the left, so I didn't break my face. But everything was there, and I was, and he caught me above the hole. You know, I fell about 20 feet straight down until it caught. It just happened instantly. My brother caught me, and he said, uh, how you doing? I'm like, uh, my hands were literally shaking. Like, he goes, well, are we going to continue? I was like, no, I don't think, I don't think I can do that. Um, and then, so he brought me down, and then he, a much better climber than me, we traded places, and he went up and cleaned it all and came back down. But um, a whipper. I wonder if Abraham, in our story today, uh, relates to any of those kinds of feelings. First of all, meeting a, a rock wall that seems insurmountable. I don't know how to get over this. Um, then some of the jarring emotion of what God asked him to do. And then like almost like a fall and a whipper in the end comes face to face with uh, God, God's will, in uh, the most dramatic story that we have in the story of, of Abraham. It is the pinnacle of the Abraham narrative. It's the peak, literally, um, of his story. It happens on a mountain. Uh, it happens to be a very important mountain. Because what happens there later is um, the greatest of stories and changes everything at the same spot. And so I invite you to Genesis 22. Um, if you've got your Bibles, you open, it'll be up on our screen. But Genesis 22, we've been walking with Abraham for a while now in our series, and we come now to um, a defining moment. And he's already had many, right? This one is uh, above them all. And what I'm going to do is read the story through, let you collect its uh, essence, it's feel, it, let you feel it in your mind, in your heart, and also in your body, because there's some hard things in this text, uh, and then we're going to walk back through it, okay? So Genesis chapter 22. Now, it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. He split wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took it in his hand, he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Then they came to the place of which God had told them. Abraham built the altar there. He arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven saying, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad. Do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens, the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gates of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived in Beersheba. How does this story make you feel? 
some prickly parts to it, right? A bit like the knife in the belt of Abraham. Um, if you handle it poorly, it can cut and wound and confuse you, yeah? It's a difficult passage. Um, lots of wrinkles and big questions for, for sure. And to be sure, I'm, I'm not attempting to, uh, as a goal, answer or all those questions or iron out all those wrinkles. But I would like to focus on a couple of things. I'd like to focus on the text and particularly the context of child sacrifice and then um, that test and what is discovered in that test of the sacrifice and help apply that to us in our life. Again, for that, you here for it? Um, let's read back through the text again and notice a couple of things. Uh, verse one, now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham. Note um, that from the outset, we are told, the audience and the original audience of this text, that this is a test. It's not hidden, it's not revealed later. It's spoken from the very outset. This is a test. Abraham, of course, doesn't know that. We are told that. Because in order for it to be a test for Abraham, there needs to be some discreet nature to it. There needs to be a, a secret nature to it. Otherwise, the test fails. Uh, it's opened up and Abraham can skirt the test, right? If this is really a pop quiz, then we can't um, have a key uh, to the quiz. This is a test. Um, we'll, we'll discover more about that test in a second, but uh, a test it is. Now, uh, this is for us today now, and through the inspiration and inerrancy of the Holy Scriptures of God, preserved for us, perfectly applicable and uh, um, real and powerful and living God's Word. We're studying it today alive. But let's recall just for a second the first original audience of this text. This was written by Moses through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit while he was in the wilderness, perhaps around Mount Sinai. They had just left Egypt. We'll do it on this side. They just left Egypt and they were headed to Canaan in the promised land, right? The original audience. Now, when we come to God's command to Abraham, let's remember where we came from in Egypt and let's recall from the rest of the story together where they are going in Canaan. Now, the Israelite Jews, newly freed from Egypt, don't know Canaan yet. They don't know the laws and customs and the gods there. God, of course, does, and he's warning them. But where did we come from in Egypt? We came from a place where child sacrifice was about the last thing that we remember, about 80 years ago. When, when Moses was born, um, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, was so scared that the Israelite nation was so numerous and prosperous and strong, God was obviously blessing them, that he said, hey, we have to have some population control here. And so they sacrificed the firstborn and the males and threw them into the Nile, which was one of the pictures of their greatest gods. So child sacrifice at the time of Moses, he lived there till he was about 40. He was in the wilderness uh, of Midian as a shepherd for about 40 years. Then he went back in the Exodus and came out for four. So he lived about 120 years, 40, 40, 40. And so less than 100 years ago, the story of where we left was child sacrifice. They don't know it yet. God does. And he warns them in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And then we see it play out in the life of the kings, especially the kings of the northern tribes in Israel much later in the story, but also kings of the southern tribes of Judah. They sacrifice their sons and daughters as burnt offerings to the fires of the false gods, which are actually demons in the land of Canaan, Molech, Baal, Asherah, etc., so they came from a place of child sacrifice in Egypt. They were headed to a place of child sacrifice in Canaan. So God says, in a sense, we're going to see this. And this was really a beautiful sort of revelation, I think, from the Lord for me. Uh, he steps into that with a very big risk. And he says, I'm going to... Um, place myself in that context of gods that require false gods, demonic gods that require child sacrifice, but it's going to be very, very different. And he does that for a very specific purpose. He does that to show that he's different than Egyptian gods or Canaanite gods, but even more so, 
he is giving us a, a picture and a prophecy of what will come later. And what will come later is the firstborn son of a father who goes willingly to a sacrifice um, as an offering for sin in the very same vicinity of what happens here in this story. So God enters into the risk to say, yes, I'm, uh, I'm placing myself into that context to show you that I'm not like those gods. I'm not like those gods. Um, but I'm also painting a picture and a prophecy of what is to come. Let's look at that. Because in the text, we must hold what we're about to read in tension with what God says through the prophet of Jeremiah in chapter 19, verse 5. He says, I hate it when my people offer their sons and daughters as a burnt offering to the gods of Baal and Molech. He said, I have never commanded it, nor has it ever entered into my heart. And so God here is doing something even more beautiful and uh, merciful and gracious than we could probably imagine at the outset. But it doesn't make it comfortable to read what I'm about to read, okay? He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am, verse two. He said, take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac. Notice four things. Each one of them gets more painful as he reads it and says it out loud. Each one of them gets more personal, your son. Your only son, the one you love, laughter. Isaac means laughter. You smile, he smiles. Your son, your only son, the one you love, laughter. It's dramatic and we're meant to go more with the text. Take now your son, your only son, the one you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer them there. Offer him there as a burnt offering on the one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Let's talk about idolatry for just a second because I think that's important to the context, although that word is not used in this chapter. Idolatry is something we saw in the Smith video, excellently done, and it's a real part of many cultures um, in the world today. Physical idols worshiped, burned incense to, et cetera, et cetera. I hope you know in America, in the West, in King County, in this room, we have idolatry too. Because my heart, I'll tell you, is an idol factory. And so is yours. That's what we do. We take good things. Because idols are only made out of good things. We take good things. We take blessings. We take gifts. And we promote them above their station to become ultimate things. And then we ask of those things... The rewards and blessings and consolations that only God can provide. And in doing so, we make them into an idol. Now, Tim Keller says this. The gift of every idol is this. You ready? The gift of every idol is the staggering despair of not finding what is sought. But... Every idol also has a drug to it. And the drug anesthetizes us to that kind of despair. You know how I know that? Because those of us in the room, including me and you, we still think that money and power and sex and possessions and all these kinds of things will make us happy. If that were true, then the richest people in the world would be the happiest people in the world. Is that true? The people with the most stuff would be the most joyful. Is that true? The people who are most promiscuous and free with their bodies would be the most uh, content. None of those things are true. In fact, they're demonstrably false. So the gift of every idol is this despair of not finding what is sought, yet the drug of every idol anesthetizes us and blinds us to that fact. And so we continue to create idols and seek what cannot be found. Now, perhaps for a second, let's consider Abraham's potential idolatry. What could he make an idol out of? Something that's good, that's a blessing, that's a gift, that he promotes to an ultimate place. Hmm. Perhaps his son? 
who's he's been waiting for for 25 years. 25 years from the initial promise, promise after promise after promise, and then he's born in the last chapter. Could this great man of fragile faith, whose love and trust of God was credited to him as righteousness, could he see this gift of a son in a way that wobbles? Could he love him in a way that wobbles in relationship to his love for God? If it's possible, and I think it's very possible, then perhaps that's why God stepped in. Because if, if idolatry is so deadly dangerous to us, is it cruel for God to intentionally try to disrupt that idolatry? No, it's not cruel. In fact, it could be considered gracious. It could be considered a gift of God trying to rescue Abraham from full-blown idolatry. And he would not be the first parent or the last to idolize their children or the thought of children, which leads to either under-discipline of their kids or over-discipline of their kids, to pandering to their kids, to fearing their kids, because they have all sort of hopes built up in their child, their daughter, their son, the collection of them, and their family, their legacy, etc., and it can quickly turn south. It can quickly rot. And God can quickly be removed from the throne of the heart and the child placed there. I wonder if this is not something Abraham would have struggled with. It, it sure makes sense that if he waited 25 years for an infant son, he's obviously not an infant son here. We have no idea how old Isaac is. Let's suggest just for the sake of argument, 10 years old, 35 years 25 waiting 10 years with this son who's able to carry wood up a mountain and have a reasonable, intelligent conversation with his father, a 10-year-old son. That's a long time for his heart to shift. Notice verse 3. Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey, took with him two of his men and his son Isaac, split wood for the burnt offering, arose and went to the place in which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham immediately obeys. Is that shocking to you? Because it's shocking to me, knowing this dude and his story. Like he, salesman in reverse, negotiated with God over Sodom and Gomorrah. Like give and take. Will you take 50? Yeah, I'll take 50. Okay, okay how, about, how about 40? You take, yeah, I'll take 40. Oh, well, I mean, stick with me. Let's, let's, will you go with 30? He gets him all the way down to 10. He negotiates. He lies about his wife several times. He's all over the map, right? He doesn't even pull like a Gideon, which comes later and says, can, can you make it wet here and dry here and then wet here and dry here? I mean, just want to confirm, make sure this is a big deal. He doesn't do any of that. He gets up in the morning, saddles his donkey and goes. And it takes three days on the third day. This is a long time to think a long time to settle in, I wonder if at the giving of the command, Abraham considered his son to, to be dead. And it took three days for him to eventually get him back. If so, um, it shines even greater light on the greater story. I think it's fascinating that it took three days. Now, as the story sort of picks up speed and then it slows way down so that we see every word, every movement uh, of what's happening here. It's really, really powerful. And I'm going to ask you a question in just a second as we read the story. And the question is, who is the sacrifice really? Because when, when Frodo took the ring to Mount Doom, it was a hard left, wasn't it? When Frodo took the ring to Mount Doom, what was the sacrifice there? Is it the precious itself, the precious thing? Or is it the person who longs for the precious thing? Who was the sacrifice? Let's read the story. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young men, really important, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go over there. We will worship and return to you. What's interesting about his word to his servants? You see anything there? First, it says he had worship in his mind. I don't think that's like a ploy or a diversion. 
or just like a candy coating on the situation. I think he really is wanting to worship. The burnt offering is a sacrificial kind of worship. So he says, we're going to go worship. What else do you see? He says, we will go worship and we will return to you. I know that the we isn't repeat, the we pronoun isn't repeated in the second half of the statement, but in Hebrew it's attached to the verb. We will go, we will return. Is that a is that just like optimism? Is he trying to keep his servants from discovering the real command so that they don't intervene or so, or is he just putting a good spin on in it? Is he being, you know, a, a reporter trying to um, Keep, keep things at bay. What, what's he doing? We will go up to worship. We will return. Uh, the book of Hebrews at the other end of our Bible adds a bit of light to it. We've been tracking in Hebrews with Abraham the whole time because Hebrews helps us. Just a couple verses in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, notice they call it a test, offering up Isaac who had received and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. You see, it was a test, his only son. Same wording. It was he to whom it was said, no, in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. So if you go back to this statement to his servants, hey, the lad and I, we will go up and worship and we will return to you. Hebrews tells us, that he had in mind, he would go up to the mountain, slay his son according to the commandment of God, and then God would bring him back to life because all of the promises went through Isaac. There was no plan C. We already tried plan B with Hagar. That didn't work. There was no plan C. So Abraham, in his understanding, said, if I'm going to go through with this, and all the text says that he had that in mind. Uh, God's got to do something that we haven't seen yet in the scriptures. We have not seen God raise anybody from the dead yet. So he has in his faith and in his heart something that is even more inconceivable in a way than the slaying of your firstborn son, only son. This is a powerful moment. This gives us a little bit of insight into Abraham's heart, his faith, his hope, his mind. And I ask you again, who is really the sacrifice? Let's continue. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke. You see how we're slowing down? We're slowing down to almost watch every step. We're watching him pack. We're watching the conversation on the way. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Ah, I see the fire in the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. So Abraham here, is he concealing something from his son? Is he spinning it again? Is he just sort of diverting? Is he trying to play fast and loose with the details? Or is if Derek Kidner suggests, is he deferring the question to God? Isaac says, uh, where's the lamb? Is it possible that Abraham from faith is saying, um, that's a question for God because I don't know how this is going to go. I don't know how this is going to turn out. I have hope and a prayer in a way that this is going to turn out. But perhaps he's even speaking prophetically beyond his ability to understand. God will provide we get from that statement, God's name there is Yahweh, um, and then the provide is Jaira. We take Yahweh, and many Jews today will say Hashem instead of, they say the name instead of saying the name Yahweh. But if you take the consonants of Yahweh, and you add the vowels of Adonai, which is master or Lord, you come together to a third sort of nonsensical word. It really doesn't mean anything. It just stands for a place called Jehovah. Jehovah is not a real word. It's consonants from one word and vowels from another put together to stand in the place so that we don't misuse, misstate, misapply the name Yahweh. So that's where we get Jehovah Jireh from. The Lord will provide his statement. And Isaac seems to say, okay. 
They came to the place of which God had told him. Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac, laid him on the wood on top of, uh, laid him on the altar on top of the wood, and Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Notice, I want you to picture this in your mind. The text tells us some things. The text doesn't tell us some things. I wonder in what the text doesn't say, what is Isaac's mentality? What is his face here? There's really kind of two great options. One of them is he is freaking out, right? And if he's 10 years old, he could probably overpower a 110-year-old man. I'm thinking, right? And so there's a, a trickery. There's something here, and Isaac is terrified. Isaac is losing it. What is happening? Wait a second. Time out. Can we just talk this through? Or, again, the text doesn't say, so we're surmising here. Or... Isaac has learned something of faith from his father. He's learned about God from his father. And in some sense, he's willing. That's harder for me to imagine, but it's possible. He bound his son, picked up his knife. Notice that Abraham is, if you picture it in your mind, notice Abraham is not looking around for plan C. And so the angel of the Lord which is an important statement. I wish we had more time to unpack that because the angel of the Lord is very often in the Old Testament, it sure seems to be the second person of the Trinity uh, before his incarnation. So we're talking about Jesus, the son of God, before he was incarnate in history, uh, appearing, often called an angel, which just means messenger of the Lord. Uh, this angel of the Lord sure seems to be God in the second episode when he speaks to him again of the promises. And so if that's true, uh, this could be God himself, perhaps even the son of God himself appearing and stopping Abraham. And this is one of the unique times when we have the name twice. When it happens in the New Testament and the gospels, it's very important. Martha, Martha, etc., etc. right? Um, here he says, Abraham, Abraham. He says, here I am. Don't stretch out your hand against the lad. Do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son. He could have added, the son you love, laughter from me. Now I know that you fear God. Let me ask you a real, real question. When has God made a discovery of something that he doesn't already know? The way that I understand God's character explained in the scriptures is his perfect wisdom, perfect knowledge, foreknowledge, his removal from a linear timeline. So his past and present and future are all in the same moment for him. There is nothing he doesn't understand. There is nothing hidden from his sight. So how could he discover that Abraham actually feared him? Was that the discovery? Was God experimenting with Abraham? So that's the test as an option. The test is, let's experiment with Abraham. Let's set up the situation to see if he really fears me. Is that really what's happening? I don't think so. It seems to contradict some of the things that I think the scriptures say about God's character. The fact that he knows all things. So who is the one discovering something? I would submit to you that it's Abraham. Because he is the sacrifice. The precious thing for him is not the sacrifice, Isaac. The precious thing is carried by the person who makes it precious. And the person who carries the precious has to make the sacrifice. In a sense, the sacrifice here is Abraham's will. It's Abraham's heart. It's Abraham's concept of God's character and God's gifts. That's the sacrifice. And so when he doesn't look around and he's about to go through it, all the text and context seems to suggest this. God comes in and says, stop, stop. And I know it says, now I know. I think this is perhaps, at least the best I can understand, some sort of accommodating or anthropomorphic language of God saying, I've discovered, where God doesn't make a discovery. It was Abraham who discovered something in that moment. And this is what Abraham discovered. He said, as much as I love my son, and can you imagine the tears in his eyes? Can you imagine the redness in his face? 
Can you imagine the, the, the blankness of his mind, the inconceivable shock and horror of what he was about to do? But he seemingly is ready and available to do it. What did he discover in that moment? He discovered, as much as I love my son, God's gift. I love God more. And there is a difference between God's gifts and God himself. It was Abraham who discovered something in that moment. Abraham's will and heart was the sacrifice. God didn't discover something. God doesn't experiment with us. He has nothing to discover. It's us who have something to discover. Um, this is a wonderful text because it shares something else that we'll see in just a second. I want to talk about the fear of the Lord uh, for a moment. For now I know that you fear God. What is fear of the Lord? That phrase is used a lot in the Old and New Testament. If your neighbor, an unchurched, not a follower of Jesus, come to you and said, hey, I just read an article or something, and some of this phrase, fear of God, says something in there, or I see it on your hoodie. And what, is, uh, what does that mean? What does that mean? What, what would you as a Jesus follower tell him? How would you explain it? I hope um, you would start with this. Well, it's not terror. We're not supposed to be in terror of God. Because he's good. But how would you define fear of the Lord? Here, here's how I would submit to you a, a very simple definition. It could improve and increase for sure. I would define fear of the Lord as this, a worshipful respect of the great difference between God and me. A worshipful respect of the great difference between God and me. God is big, I am small. God is perfectly holy, I am wrought through with sin. God's ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. He sees and knows everything. I don't. He is unlimited. I'm limited. He's infinite. I am very finite. A worshipful, reverent respect of the great difference between God and me. And a, and a respect that implicates and activates what I do and how I live. That, by the way, Solomon would tell us is the first door to being wise. If you want to be a wise woman or wise man, you must first wrestle with a worshipful kind of respect over the great difference between God and you. Um, that's what I think fear of the Lord is, in a sense. Again, I told you it can improve and increase that definition. But he says, now I understand. Abraham, speaking to himself in this moment, now I understand. Wow. Watch what happens next, because this becomes important. Then we're going to apply that fear of the Lord. Who wants to do that now? What does fear of the Lord mean in, in action? I think in the story of Abraham, we're going to see it play out in at least three ways. The first one is what we would call surrender. I would submit to you that word surrender. Fear of the Lord, a, a worshipful respect of the great difference between God and me means that I don't have cards to play. My hands are not on the controls. And so my heart an attitude must be one of surrender. And the big question behind the surrender is, do you trust the heart of God? Do you trust the heart of God? Because the opposite of surrender would be something like hoarding or control. And the spirit behind that is fear. And fear and control essentially say, I, I don't trust you with these things. I have to have them. Surrender is the opposite. The big question is, do you trust the heart of God? Surrender in Abraham's heart wasn't enough. He had to actualize it. He had to put it into practice in the second part, I think, of fearing the Lord in Abraham's story. And that's sacrifice. We saw that. Sacrifice. Am I trusting in the will of God, in his goodness? And if I sacrifice something on the altar, will I lose what's good? Or will God's blessing and honor and grace and mercy give me something even better, even if it's just more of himself? How willing are you to actualize your surrender into sacrifice? Are you willing to lay your idols on an altar? In the Old Testament, it's the only way to demote an idol, by the way, is to sacrifice it. 
The only way to get rid of a sacred cow is to put it on an altar. And that's a question. Do you trust God's goodness? Can you lay your Isaac down? Because again, idols are only made out of good things. Good things. And by the way, Abraham's test was even greater because his son Isaac, listen, Abraham was 100% sure that this boy was a gift of God's promise and will. There was no question. It's not like something he fashioned himself and was really fond of. It was a clear, clear gift from God's will, perfectly in the center of his will, which was the hardest sacrifice to make because that's the inconceivable. You don't know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all that you have. As the saying goes, Abraham discovered that. He didn't know God was all that he needed until the inconceivable commandment came and God was all that he had left. Surrender to sacrifice. Finally, I would consider you to apply and think with the Lord about the word security because that's what we see next. Security. Do you enjoy the safety, freedom, joy, and security of being a, God, a God's daughter and God's son under his promise. Do you really enjoy that? Or are you living in fear still? Fear that's a remnant of a past life before you were saved and redeemed by Jesus. Fear has no place in your life. Now it shouldn't, but I gotta tell you, I hold on to it. I live with a lot of fear. It's always been a deep shadow behind me since I was little. I've been working, trying, praying, I've experienced more and more freedom, but it's still there. Surrender, sacrifice, security. That's the story we see in this fear of God with Abraham. Let's finish it. Verse 13, then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket. Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up in a burnt offering in the place of his son. We have a substitute sacrifice. That's important. We have a substitutionary sacrifice. This, I think, this comes long before the Mosaic Law, long before the Sinai Code, long before the book of Leviticus in the timeline of history. This is probably the basis for those sacrifices that God directs Moses to give as a sin offering. Why? I can't pay for my own sin because it will take my life. What do I do? I bring a lamb in place as a substitute for me. And in the book of Hebrews again, it tells us the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin, can never remove sin. It just covered over it. So this is the basis for so many things, for the Mosaic law of sacrifices, which is the seed basis thought for the greater, the greatest Isaac that would come on a particular mountain and offer himself as a substitute, as the firstborn son of God and solve sin for all time. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. And as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. So that surrender to sacrifice leads to this security. Here's the end. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. He seems to identify himself with the Lord here, which I think is a yet another reason for us to strongly consider that this angel of the Lord is something much more than just a created angel, but perhaps even God himself, perhaps. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld, what? Well, ooh, your son, your only son, he could have added whom you love, whom you smile at. Because you have not withheld your son, your only son. Paul uses this in Romans 8. He says, like Abraham, God did not withheld or withhold his son, his only son. And if that is true, then will he not freely give us all things? He says, because you have done this, indeed, I will greatly bless you, greatly multiply your seed, stars of the heavens and the sandwich on the seashore. All of that's new, uh, not new. We've seen that before. Oh, this is new. And, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. That's new. In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, not new, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his men, and they went to Beersheba because he lived in Beersheba. So we have 
repeating of the covenant, but we have this new thing. Your, your seed shall possess the gates of their enemies. Probably a throwaway phrase, right? We just read right over that. Perhaps not. Remember they left Egypt where child sacrifice is prevalent? Was their story at least. They're going into Canaan where child sacrifice is prevalent. The gate of a city is the judicial, legal, social center of the city. It's where the elders of the city sit and make decisions. It's where they judge disputes and cases. It's so, in a sense, it's where culture is set and made. And if a culture of demonic idol worship and child sacrifice is prevalent in a city in Canaan, you know it was prevalent in the gate. So here's the promise of God. Your family, Abraham, will possess the gate of their enemies. They will set in the judicial, social, legal center. They will set the culture. And child sacrifice will not be a part of my family's legacy. I am not that God. I am different than Egypt. I am different than Canaan. It's never even entered into my mind, Jeremiah 19, verse 5. I think that's important. So finally this. A little throwaway passage, bring it all together from Second Chronicles. Who reads Second Chronicles anyway, right? Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. Um, then, um, nope, Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place where David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. That last story is in 2 Samuel 24, where David makes a mistake out of hubris and sets a census and God sends a plague. Thousands of people die. And he goes up on top of a mountain that he doesn't know of yet. And he pleads with the Lord. And the angel of the Lord comes, interesting, and says, it is enough. And the plague stops right there. And, and David buys that spot from Ornan. And then eventually gives it to his son. Now let's collect all the things that happened there. That's Mount Moriah. That's where this story just happened. Centuries later, centuries later, um, David buys it because a plague stopped. And the angel of the Lord said, it is enough. And then he gives it to his son who builds the temple on that spot. The dome on the rock that stands in the temple mount today if you go on the inside of it, you can Google this. You go on the inside of it, they have an exposed portion of the bedrock in the center of that mosque. That is the top of Mount Moriah, where tradition says this story happened. And then the David story happened. And then the temple was built where Jesus interacted. And then just right outside that, in the vicinity of Moriah, just down the hill, 75, 100 yards, is where the firstborn son of God put the wood of the cross on his back in the same place and went willingly to the cross as a substitute sacrifice for sin for you and me. How can the story be any more beautiful when God risked placing himself in this terrible context of child sacrifice? I suspect for the purpose of removing himself from that context saying that is not me it's never been me but he risks himself placing it in there so that he can say that is not me and he can give us a picture of what would come does he ever command it of us no was he willing to accept it himself yes yes because he loves you because he loves me because he loves Taiwan because he loves the world. He gave us his only son who willingly went to a place of sacrifice as a substitute. He himself committed no sin. He knew no sin, yet became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's the gospel. That's the story. And that's really the conclusion of Genesis 22. Genesis 22 just starts a story. Jesus ends it. And the very last word of the last chapter of that beautiful little gospel story is yours to write. Do you include yourself in that story by accepting it by faith? Do you include yourself in that story because God longs to include you in that story? Have you included yourself in that story 
by choosing to trust in Jesus, the perfect and greater, greatest Isaac, who is the perfect sacrifice and substitute for our sin. It's open to you. Let me pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you. We love you. For any who are captivated by this story, even if it still has hard questions, perhaps now is a moment where they see Jesus in the same vicinity, Mount Moriah, even more clearly. And they would, in their heart, pray, God, I see. They still have some questions, but they don't seem important anymore. So I love you. I want to say, I trust you. And I receive the gift of forgiveness and adoption and redemption because of what Jesus, your son, has done on the cross in the empty grave. I receive it. I thank you for it. I accept it. And I trust you unto new life, eternal life, and abundant. For the rest of us, Father, would you repeat those hard questions in our heart? Just in a moment now, speak to us. Do we really believe that you will provide? Do we trust your heart? Are we willing to surrender? Do we trust in your goodness, in the goodness of your will? Can we sacrifice our lesser idols? joyfully live in the security of daughter and son. Live under the same new and renewed promises in the New Testament that Jesus has given us, his church. God help us.